Great. Well, welcome everybody to day three, uh, AI for climate science. I, my name is Donna and I'll be your lead TA and Amanda is here with me and she will be your support TA today. And we'd just like to thank the supporters of this event, CIFAR, Mila Quebec Institute, Volkswagen Group of America, and, uh, and worldsphere.ai. All right, so Climate Change AI, it's a volunteer initiative, a nonprofit that catalyzes work that's at the intersection of climate change and machine learning. And if you wanna find out more, you can go to our website, www.climatechange.ai. You can also follow us on Twitter at Climate Change AI. You can, uh, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to the um, join on the community platform. And there's also a newsletter you can subscribe to. Okay, so this is a very important part. So pay attention. If you have any questions for today's speaker, what you need to do is go to the community platform and then you need to go to the summer school space. And then you'll see that there's a few specific spaces. There's a space called lecture Q&A. And there you can add any questions you have for today's speaker in the comment stream. And how we'll be doing this, since there's so many of you with so many great questions, we may not have time to get to them all. We'll try our best. But questions that have more, uh, more votes or more likes uh, will have a higher chance of getting asked. So make sure you write your questions in there and we'll be, we'll be watching that. And this is very important. If uh, you, so all of you must abide by CCAI's code of conduct. If there's anything, uh, if any situation arises, please, please, please report this to reporting at climatechange.ai. And one more thing for today, uh, we've enabled closed captioning. So you'll, you'll be able to toggle that on uh, in, your, in your settings if you want closed captions. All right, so today's schedule, we have one speaker, Dr. Kasia Tukarska, and we've split the day in, into two sections. So the first section, uh, the, the first part will be about an hour, uh, AI for climate science, part one. And then there'll be a little bit of a break. So you can have coffee, uh, you can uh, run and come back. We'll also take some clarification questions if there's any content related questions there. And then we'll go to the second part. Uh, part two, and we will address all of your big picture questions at the very end of, during a Q&A and discussion at the end of part two. So that's today's schedule. And your speaker today is Dr. Kasia Tukarska, and she has over uh, nine years of research experience um, with earth system climate models of all different levels of complexity. She's, um, she's been working at the intersection of the climate system and the statistics, so the stats analysis. Um, and she's also interested in physics informed machine learning and deep learning. So uh, without further ado, I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Kasia Tukarska. Uh, thank you so much for the very nice introduction. And I'm really excited for today's lecture. Um, so yeah, so today we're going to focus on the machine learning applications for climate science, but the first part of the lecture is going to focus more on the climate modeling bit. So just kind of physics of climate modeling. How do we model climate change? And what are the climate models we currently use that are not necessarily AI models. These are kind of physics based climate models. And then the second part of the lecture will focus on the machine learning applications. Can we use machine learning in this kind of climate modeling? When can it be useful or not? Uh, and then after the discussion in the end and q and I'm also going to introduce the tutorial on the machine learning for climate science. Uh, and the office hours for that tutorial are going to be happening next Monday, July 3rd. Um, so maybe we can launch the first question before get, we get started. What are people feelings about using machine learning to predicting climate change? Do you think it's a good idea or not? Um, just give us our, give us your kind of view in this poll that is going to be shared now.
Okay, we started getting some replies. So the question is, do you think AI can be used for climate science? Uh, we have quite a bit of enthusiastic people that think it's a lot uh, of AI can be used for climate science. There are some people that are more conservative thinking it's only to some extent. And some very optimistic people who think AI can actually replace climate science. So it's a very interesting group. Um, uh, great to see the great enthusiasm. I think the a lot answer is quite encouraging one. Um, yeah, sounds good. So hopefully maybe as we move on uh, through this lecture, uh, maybe your opinions will change or maybe you'll get like more information how AI can be used in the field of climate science. So, okay, so let's go back um, to the lecture slides. And now you can see, um, I'm going to start talking about climate models. And in this case, we're talking about physics-based climate models. Um, I highly encourage you to have a look at this TED talk. It's called, uh, it's, go, uh, it's by a NASA scientist, Gavin Schmidt. Uh, the TED talk's title is Emergent Patterns of Climate Change. And this TED talk very nicely explains um, what a physics-based climate model is and how to use it for climate modeling. Um, so kind of just to briefly summarize, if you think about our climate system, we have the ocean, atmosphere, land, we have different components of the climate system. And each of those components can be thought of being like a piece of a puzzle, right? Like you've got the ocean piece, you have atmosphere, you have land, and you need to put them all together to model the entire system. So you can develop a physics-based model to, to model ocean only, like how does the ocean behave? You can use physics-based model to model kind of maybe the land and how does the land and the vegetation on the land behave? How does the atmosphere behave? What is the atmospheric physics behind that, right? So each of those pieces of puzzles can be parameterized by different physics equations. And then you put them all together. But what's really important is that those pieces of puzzle need to interact between each other because the ocean and land and atmosphere are all connected, right? If you emit carbon to the atmosphere, some of it travels to the ocean, some of it travels to land. So imagine that there's like a lot of interconnectivity between those different pieces of puzzle. Um, and that's what we're going to deep dive a little in the coming slides. Um, but before we do that, like, let's think of like what kind of climate models there could be. So you could have like a very conceptual model that is very simple. For example, a model maybe only of the ocean or where the ocean is uh, conceptualized as a box. So you have like a three dimensional box and there's like different type of water of different density, maybe different temperature. And then this water gets mixed and you kind of get some sort of ocean currents. So you can have a very simple conceptual model. It's going to have a very quick computing time, but you can see that the number of processes you can represent is limited. So you, you're not scoring too high on number of processes and also on the granularity of like how granular this model can be. On the other hand, you can have like this very comprehensive Earth system model that has all the processes like atmosphere, ocean, land, parameterized by the physics equations. But then if you put it all together, it's going to have a very high, like very high computing time, which means it's not going to perform well on the computing time. So this is kind of like computing time performance. So performance on computing time here is low, but you have a lot of granularity. You can have a high resolution model and you also can have a lot more processes in this model. And then there's kind of like intermediate complexity models, which um, there's uh, several of them that actually perform quite well. And they are in balance between, between these two other extremes. So they have intermediate amount of processes. So they do have land, ocean, atmosphere, but maybe some simplified versions of it. They do have a uh, quite reasonable computing time. So they score like in the middle and the projections they make are like kind of like generally fine, but they are not as high resolution as the comprehensive models. So depending on your use case, you might use different type of model, right? So like if you're really interested in like climate risk assessment for a specific region and you need to know everything like sea level rise, drought, heat wave, all the different hazards, then probably a comprehensive model of high resolution will be a good choice. But if you're interested in like better understanding like ocean dynamics or like uh, what happens to the sea ice, then maybe a, a con conceptual model that is simpler and computes faster can be a better choice because then you can parameterize it more and like try different cases. Uh, so there's different type of physics-based models. And like, this is an example of this kind of intermediate complexity model. Um, the specific one I'm showing is called U UVIC ESM, which is uh, developed by the University of Victoria, but also used uh, in different research centers across the world. And uh, there's like an atmospheric model. So you have a kind of atmospheric model, general circulation model for the ocean. So the ocean has like um, ocean neighbor stocks equations, right? Like to have the ocean circulation, you also have a land surface scheme. 
And as you can see, there's transfer of energy, water, and carbon across those different components. So if there's carbon in the atmosphere, it can go to the ocean. So the ocean captures carbon, but also the ocean can release carbon back to the atmosphere. And similarly, the land can release carbon to, uh, to the atmosphere and capture it um, and energy and water. So you can see that there's different transfers of the different things. And in, in those processes have to be conserved. So you have like some sort of physical rules that rule the climate system and the energy in the whole climate system has to be conserved. So you can't be just losing energy. It has to be, you lose it somewhere, but you gain it somewhere else, right? And same with water, there's like a finite amount of water we have on Earth. So you can't just be losing water in one component and it goes somewhere you don't know where. It kind of has to go somewhere within those components. And then we also have a vegetation model. And that's how you can see the vegetation model causes that the land surface scheme can also uptake some vegetation, uh, some carbon, but you can also release carbon to the atmosphere and likewise energy and water. So, so like all those different processes um, need to be conserved in the end. Um, and like, let's look into like specifically for land, for example, if we have a terrestrial carbon sink, um, what, like how we could model it based on a kind of like physics and like a science um, understanding of the terrestrial carbon sink. Uh, so we know that various plant types might have different preferences, how, how fast they grow and how efficient they are in taking up CO2 from the atmosphere. And those processes will depend both on the atmospheric CO2 concentration and on temperature. So if some plants might prefer warmer conditions and they are more productive in taking up CO2 in warmer temperatures. But for some other plants, maybe if the, if the climate gets warmer, they become less productive because it's too hot for them, right? And similarly with the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, sometimes if you have a, a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, some plants might be more productive in taking it up because it's easier for them to capture CO2 in a way. Uh, but uh, again, this process has a limit. So once you exceed the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that is like this productivity peak, right? Then it's no longer uh, added value. So the way we can model it, for example, uh, and again, like think conceptually, like, of course, we cannot model every single plant because that model will be like extremely difficult to compute. Um, so you can think about it like uh, of those different grid cells, right? So like, let's say you have a 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer grid cell, and then it's being split into the different vegetation types. So like in this specific model, I think they have like about six different vegetation covers, right? So that could be like a boreal forest, tropical forest, uh, for example, like a different type of um, grass and so on. And each of those plants have different parameters. How, what's the optimal temperature? What's the amount of carbon they want to take up to be efficiently storing it? And uh, that's that's kind of what's referred to like net prim primary productivity would be your total flux. So like based on those different plant types that grow in the square, you get possibly some carbon uh, stored into the soil carbon pool. And then there's also like soil respiration processes that move this carbon further down. Um, and again, the soil respiration is subject to temperature and moisture. So depending on how hot the soil is, how moist the soil is, like it might behave uh, more or less efficiently. Uh, so you can see that those different like energy amount of carbon, like all those different processes affect how much carbon is being stored. Um, and that's kind of like for the vegetation model. And you can see that also like this external forcing. Uh, so for example, we have solar forcing, but we also have winds and we also have uh, greenhouse gases, which is the main kind of external forcing, because this is like just the model of the climate system, right? Like this is how climate behaves in a steady state. But what happens if we start emitting lots of CO2 to the atmosphere? So then you kind of get in a way imbalance because this whole model's imbalance is balanced already. But if you start adding a lot of CO2 from the emissions we cause, right? And then this whole balance is going to be changed because the carbon then has to be again redistributed between atmosphere, ocean and land. And uh, that has also implications on the energy kind of like another uh, conservation loss, right? So, so that's why like if we have a steady state climate model, we can kind of perturb it by adding anthropogenic CO2 to the atmosphere because we kind of like are burning fossil fuels from the ground and like adding carbon here. And then like the earth system has to do something to kind of handle this carbon. Um, so again, like coming back to the natural carbon sinks, they kind of act on different time scales. So we have some short time scales, which is up to like maybe 100 years. So it includes photosynthesis and respiration that we talked about, and also the solution of CO2 in the ocean. 
and so ocean carbon storage. Uh, but then we can also have longer term processes such as like uh, calcium carbonate in ocean sediments and very long processes like weathering processes and the sedimentary rocks. So the, the climate system like acts on different time scales and some of the processes you will not see the effect until like very long time from now on. Um, and again, like just uh, thinking about those different feedbacks in the climate system, we just talk about the kind of like um, uh, land carbon feedbacks where the plants are interacting with the soil carbon and then we also have like soil respiration and then decomposition which releases carbon back to the atmosphere but you can also have like uh, you can also have uh, forest fire for example or anthropogenic carbon emissions which cause a lot of additional co2 back to the atmosphere and similarly for the ocean the ocean can take up carbon and also release carbon depending on its acidity depending on like what temperature it is it becomes the, um, the efficiency of carbon uptake differs on those different conditions uh, so we also have photosynthesis and decomposition kind of like in the ocean carbon cycle as well. Um, so what's really important to maybe note is from all this anthropogenic carbon we emit to the atmosphere, about half of it gets absorbed by land and ocean and the other half remains in the atmosphere. So whatever emissions we measure in the atmosphere, it's, it's in a way like about half of what we emitted because the other half naturally gets absorbed by the ocean and land carbon sinks. And in addition to carbon cycle feedbacks, there's also a lot of other feedbacks. So this is like maybe physics-based feedbacks. Uh, so some of them is like, for example, snow ice, albedo feedback, right? So if the ice cover is larger, the earth surface will be more white and then white color reflects sunlight, right? So it doesn't absorb it. So in a sense, it has like a cooling effect. On the other hand, if there's less ice uh, cover, then you're gonna get like maybe more ocean, which is darker color and darker colors absorb radiation. So it, they actually also absorb the heat related to it. Um, there's also like some other feedbacks, for example, cloud feedback, which we'll discuss further in the coming slides, water vapor feedback um, and non-CO2 like uh, aerosols, how they are reacting uh, in the atmosphere and so on. Um, so this, this graph is also from the IPCC report and it kind of shows you like the different time scales on which those different feedbacks take place. Um, and the reason why I'm showing it is to show you that the Earth system is really complicated. It's not as simple as modeling the temperature or modeling carbon in the atmosphere, because as you can see, all those processes interact with each other. So it's quite hard to, in a sense, get to model one thing only because it's being impacted by all the other things. Um, all right, so if we move on, uh, we can again like have kind of uh, explanation of the, a land carbon cycle in a bit different way. So you have atmosphere and land, and then through photosynthesis, the plants uh, can take up carbon, right? Then through decomposition, they can move this carbon from the plant to soil, and that's subject to moisture and temperature. Then we have soil, resp then we have respiration of plants, which also releases carbon back to the atmosphere. So the question now is, and this is another poll question here, if CO2 emissions continue to increase in the atmosphere, what will happen to the net carbon uptake? Is the net carbon uptake in this picture going to increase, stay the same or decrease? Um, if, if we have kind of like, if, if we have conditions where the atmospheric CO2 is increasing because of anthropogenic uh, emissions. So let's see what the polls are um, telling us. All right, so that's quite interesting that uh, about two thirds of people think the net carbon uptake on land is going to increase, but about one third of people, or maybe 20% of people think it's going to decrease and some people think it's going to remain unchanged. And to be fair, this question is quite uh, challenging because the answer uh, is not that straightforward. So maybe if we go back um, to the slide, um, 
we can see that actually the net effect really depends on both temperature and CO2 concentration. So if we increase the amount of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere, yes, the plants may take up more carbon because of the CO2 fertilization. So they might become more productive and then they take up more carbon. Uh, but at the same time, as you uh, emit more CO2 to the atmosphere, you cause global warming. So the temperature is going to be warmer. And maybe for some plants, the increased temperature has also positive effect because they become even more productive. But maybe for some other plants, they become less productive because it's too warm for them. So the, I guess in a sense, the question was a bit tricky because it depends on what type of plant it is. And also it depends what the effect of temperature is on this plant. Uh, but I think in principle, uh, the, the key idea here is to remember that those processes are highly nonlinear. So it's not just like one thing increases and then it decreases. It's like if one thing increases, um, carbon uptake can either increase or decrease depending on those other circumstances. So you kind of need to, in a sense, have those different parameters in your model because otherwise um, you might not be able to model it effectively and to know what type of plant it is, what's the temperature, what's the CO2 concentration and some other additional parameters. All right, so if we now move on to the cloud feedback and it's very similar kind of pictures, so you have atmosphere and land and now Land is being actually uh, kind of like emitting radiation back to the atmosphere, right? Because the surface gets warm and any warm body is going to emit radiation back to the atmosphere. Uh, and then we have two types of clouds. We have a low cloud and a high cloud. And so low clouds are brighter, so they have a higher albedo. So they actually reflect more of the radiation back to the atmosphere. So, uh, and then uh, high clouds, on the other hand, have low albedo, so they are darker and they reflect less radiation back to the atmosphere. Um, so as a result, uh, they also have opposing emission temperatures. And what it means, because the low cloud emits most of the radiation back to the atmosphere for the reflection, it doesn't emit too much radiation back to Earth. While on the other hand, because the high cloud doesn't reflect too much radiation, it gets warmer, and then it reflects, uh, it actually emits a lot of radiation back to the air. So as you can see, the effect of the, the low cloud is going to be kind of, that effect is cooling because like this red arrow here is quite small. And then the effect of a high cloud is going to be warming because uh, it actually like, emits more radiation uh, towards the air. This red arrow is bigger here. So what's the net cloud effect? Well, it really depends on how many clouds you have of which type, right? Because if it's only low clouds, then it's cooling. If it's high clouds, it's warming. If it's a mix of low and, cloud, uh, cl uh, low and high clouds, it really depends what the net effect is, right? On, on those different circumstances of the climate system. Um, so now if we move in, like how those feedbacks are being represented in the model and like in a way, how do they uh, lead us to the net output, which is the kind of climate change conditions, like how much warming is happening, how much sea level rise is happening. Um, so the input to these models are the CO2 emissions, as we said, like, so we have different emission pathways, which can be historical, like how much emissions we emitted historically, and then the different future emission pathways depending on like different assumptions about social economic uh, human behavior. So there could be like a worst case scenario where we just continue emitting or, or there could be like high ambitious mitigation scenarios in which uh, emissions continue to decline to net zero. Um, and that's what the kind of climate model processes do in the middle. So we take those input emissions as a perturbation in a way, and this affects your atmospheric CO2 and then atmospheric CO2 then has feedbacks with land carbon cycle and ocean carbon cycle, as we just discussed. And uh, in the end, the net effect of those feedbacks from land and carbon cycle after interacting with the atmosphere is going to determine your output, which is your climate change results. But then also atmospheric CO2 also has a direct impact as well. So as you can see, it's a bit complicated. And then the output, uh, so it's like how much the climate is changing in different components of the climate system, really depends on the net atmospheric CO2, land carbon cycle, and ocean carbon cycles, like all this kind of dashed lines here. Um, and so that's what we call a climate model. The climate model, what it does, it just takes different emission pathways, and then it tells you how much is climate change happening. But because of the climate system being so complicated, like you kind of have lots of processes in this box represented. Um, and yes, you could in principle have like a machine learning model instead of this gray box here, and like just input emissions and get some output. But in the second half of the lecture, 
we'll discuss, can we actually do that? And if we want to do it, what are kind of like, you know, a smart ways to do it and what you should not be doing, right? Because um, if you just put a machine learning model here, it would be quite hard for the machine learning model to have all this like conservation of carbon, conservation of water, energy, and I kind of like make sure all those things inside the box uh, still are making sense, you know, a physically consistent way. And there's also a lot of uncertainties in the climate and the climate carbon feedbacks. So we just discussed how we can parameterize the feedbacks. But as I said, sometimes it's quite hard to know what's actually the net effect of the feedback. So some feedbacks are more certain than others. Uh, so for example, like surface albedo, like the net feedback would be, for example, positive. Uh, and you can see it's mostly positive, but like for clouds, you can see there is some chance it could be negative, but it's mostly positive as well. So positive feedbacks may amplify the initial climate response to radiative forcing, and then the negative feedbacks may diminish uh, kind of climate response to the radiative forcing, means they can cause cooling. So the blue ones can cause cooling, the orange ones can cause warming. Um, and now if we add to it the biogeophysical and non-CO2 biochemical climate feedbacks and the carbon cycle feedbacks we discussed, as you can see, there's like a lot of uncertainty in some of them, what's the net direction, because this direction really depends on those different kind of circumstances such as emissions, uh, temperature and so on. Um, and uh, what's next? So I think uh, what's really interesting about this field is uh, that you get to do like a lot of exploration of like what's, for example, the future uh, potential outcomes given different scenarios. Uh, because like, as you can see, after like 1950s, um, we have carbon dioxide level here. It's kind of been like in natural cycles up and down, up and down. But what's happening now, since kind of the pre-industrial times, we have been just emitting CO2 to the atmosphere and like a much higher rate than ever observed, right? So, so it's not only it's natural cycles in the climate, but also like what we're doing, we're just altering it a lot. And that's why we're now like entering conditions that maybe hasn't really been observed previously. And that's again, like there would be potential challenge for machine learning because if you learn on the past data, the future data might be different than the past. All right, so let's uh, briefly talk more about future climate scenarios. Um, so there's like different kind of representative concentration pathways, which are called either RCPs or the newer version of them is called SSPs. And they result from different combinations of like economic, technological, demographic and policy projections. Um, so basically you have those kind of scenarios like worst case, best case, kind of like what could happen in the future. And in order to design those scenarios, again, it's not like really as simple as, well, you can assume it's linear. We're just going to continue growing at a current rate forward. But you can also include a lot of other parameters in order to have maybe more informed scenario, which depends on social economic um, scenarios, like how the population is behaving, how GDP is behaving, how much land use we're having right now, what is going to happen to this land use, and so on. So there's like a lot of kind of uh, parameters that the uh, integrated assessment models take into account in order to generate those pathways. And as a result, uh, this kind of repository of emission pathways, so this example is for RCP and then SSP would be a newer version of it. Uh, they tell you like the projections for the historical period and for the future period, uh, like how does the land use behave? How does the atmospheric CO2 concentration behave? And so on. Uh, so just as an example, this again, like net negative kind of emissions are here. Uh, here's our zero line and here's our positive emissions. Um, so as you can see, historical emissions have been like continually increasing until like about kind of present day. And then what will happen next? So you can have this kind of RCP 8.5, which is kind of a worst case scenario in a sense. This is like even beyond the worst case. This is kind of like burning like literally all uh, kind of fossil fuel resources on the planet. But in fact, maybe at some point it's not even economically viable to burn them. But like, anyway, like let's know the upper end, like what could be the upper end of climate responses. And then on the other hand, you can also have like this kind of ambitious mitigation scenario. Uh, so for example, RCP 2.6, which is, as you can see, it reaches zero line here and then it actually becomes negative. So at some point you have net negative emissions, which means you actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. And then you can have scenarios in between that have also like quite different social economic assumptions among them. Uh, so, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in this modeling. So it's not only uncertainty in the climate feedbacks, how much the climate will react to different forcings, but also it's uncertainty in what will humans do in the future. And actually, this uncertainty is the biggest, because like if we follow business as usual versus, versus ambitious mitigation pathway, the outcomes will be quite different. 
And also there might be uncertainty in like how well climate models represent the climate system. So we can have like internal climate variability. So it's uh, like maybe the day-to-day -day or year-on-year -year kind of variability in weather and due to like other kind of like oscillations. And also we have this uncertainty in climate feedbacks. Um, so, so it's kind of important to know that like all this modeling is subject to those different uncertainties and you can see internal variability is kind of shown here by like this up and down, up and down. Um, and the way, like why it's really important is like, because if you have, for example, a Nino year, it's a, sometimes it's warmer year globally, so it's up. And if it's La Nina year, it's going to be down. So just because you're here, for example, and the temperature goes down, it doesn't mean it's on a declining trend because you can see that the upward trend is it's upwards, right? Uh, and just those fluctuations uh, happen but your overall trend is upwards. So, so the, those uncertainties need to be taken into account because you can't just take one number or like temperatures or emissions are here, next year they're like much lower, so they declined. No, uh, you kind of are interested in like the overall trend as well. Um, so what we're going next um, to explore a little bit is the climate response to this kind of high emission scenario. So like in a way, what's the worst case? What's the upper end of this modeling? And then in an ambitious mitigation scenario and compare them. Um, so maybe let's launch another pool here, which is like, what will happen to Earth sur surface air temperature under this kind of very high emission scenario where we just continue emissions and nothing else happens? Like, what do you think will happen to Earth, Earth temperature? And also maybe think about like what regions might be most affected. So let's launch another pool about uh, that question. Okay, maybe you have a technical issues here, or maybe people didn't notice the poll. But okay, maybe um, I'll just continue and hopefully we can answer the next poll then. Um, all right. So what will happen to Earth surface temperature when we continue this high emission scenario? So hopefully most of you uh, thought that the Earth surface temperature will increase. And as you can see, kind of like in this, oh, in this animation that doesn't work, I'm oh, sorry. Um, in this animation, but you can go to the source here to see the entire animation. What you, you would see on this animation is that like actually the temperature increases over time a lot uh, and it becomes like really warm in the end in all the regions. Um, and what actually happens, like if you have the snapshot by the year 2100, so this is kind of like the snapshot in the end, what happens here is a lot more warming is happening on the northern hemisphere than on the southern hemisphere. Um, so again, it's it's a very, it's kind of nonlinear in a way pattern because like depending on where you're located, the same amount of global emissions might have like different regional impacts depending on your geography and the kind of climate physics. And uh, if we kind of analogously go to the like low emission scenario, so this is like this very ambitious mitigation scenario. And again, if if you want to like think about like what will happen to surface air temperature, and which regions will be most affected. Uh, so again, possibly it would be similar regions because like it's the regions that uh, kind of respond to temperature. But what actually is interesting is the question, is the temperature going to go down or is it just going to slow down in its warming rate? Let's see, maybe uh, we can launch another pool. Like what will happen to surface air temperature in like this ambitious mitigation scenario? Let me try to. Uh, and Dr. Tokarska, do you want to do you want to answer a clarification question while we wait for the answers to come in? Um, cause there sure. might, he, yes, so yeah. here's here's the answers. Sorry, from the last poll now, uh, the surface air temperature. So, so some answers have come in for that. Uh, 
and the clarification question was was around the idea of the ice cover. If the ice cover increases, say, because of, uh, we're we're doing mitigation actions, it increases the polar ice cover. Could that albedo uh, actually cause more warming in return because the it's reflecting heat upwards, but then that becomes trapped? I guess that was the question. Okay, um, so that's actually an interesting question. And it, it's a combination of several effects. I think this question is a bit um, referring to several things happening at the same time, because if generally, if you consider albedo alone, if your albedo increases, if you have a bigger ice cover because you ended up cooling, then uh, you have more white surface. So it reflects more radiation back to space. So in principle, this should co co cause cooling. But then when we talk about the cloud cover, if you have high clouds over that region, then the high clouds would, for example, like also reflect more radiation back, right? Like, so it really depends. Like if it's only albedo alone, then it should, should cause cooling. But then like also you kind of need to think about like, well, if it's, you know, reflecting a lot of radiation back to the atmosphere, but you have a very dense high clouds cover, then maybe those clouds are actually getting warmer and reflecting back. So, so it could be like multiple processes happening, but albedo alone should cause cooling. Uh, another thing to also consider is even though you're like, let's say global mean temperature right now, um, it's like at a certain level, right? And then the ice started mel melting. If you reverse temperature just a tiny bit, well, the ice not necessarily is going to start growing back because the ice has a zero temperature, like zero degrees Celsius that it can start growing back. So sometimes you need to go back a lot lower before you can kind of reinitiate those processes because melting of ice, um, like in order to freeze ice, you need to have like a negative temperature. Uh, all right, so coming back to this question, uh we have here uh, the answers Oops. sorry no worries yeah sorry i'm looking and here's the answers to the yeah. oh so the, this, this is one. One. okay so yeah. for the ambitious mitigation scenario what will happen to surface air temperature and that's interesting because about half of the people think it's going to increase some people think it will decrease or remain unchanged so okay let's see what happens and hopefully the video might work this time let's see Okay, yeah, I think it should work this time. So this is the kind of temperature map in a like kind of historical period. And hopefully, as you can see, this video is changing. So this is what's happening to temperature in this ambitious mitigation scenario. As you can see, there's like kind of like still some warming happening in the northern hemisphere and kind of like maybe not much change over the ocean. So the ocean color is like close to zero, very minor change, but you still get like some small change in the upper part northern hemisphere, right? And there's tiny bit of cooling emerging here. So you can see here, there's tiny bit of cooling. Um, so as you can see, even in this very ambitious mitigation scenario, uh, the temperature is actually overall slightly increasing, maybe cooling only in this region, and generally either zero or slightly increasing. So in order to cause kind of global cooling, if you want all the regions to be cooling, you actually would need to remove even more CO2 from the atmosphere from like the negative emissions. Um, so this is the comparison of the snapshot in time of those maps in like the year 2100, uh, like 20, 2081 to 2100. And as you can see, RCP 2.6, it's still, it's mostly cooling. There's only some regions which might be, so, sorry, it's mostly warming. There's some regions only that it could be cooling uh, or like very small warming. And then RCP 8.5 is cooling a lot more. So again, as you can see, it's it's usually the same regions, but they get like intensified. So especially for warming, climate change intensifies the, the kind of warming in various regions, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, and then uh, we just um, have similar question now. So, you know, there's like some warming happening also in this ambitious mitigation scenario. What will happen to the global, sea, uh, global mean sea level rise? So what do you think sea level rise is going to happen in this kind of ambitious mitigation scenario? And we have another poll question for this. So think about like, how does the ocean respond, right? Because in a warming scenario, the ocean continues to rise, right? Because of thermal inertia and because of the ice sheet melt. So you get like a lot of water expansion and then the sea level continues to rise. But if we have like this very ambitious mitigation scenario where there's not much warming happening or like even the cooling in some regions, what do you think uh, will happen to the sea level? Oh, sorry, okay.
I hope I'm showing the correct poll answer. <clears throat> I'm just gonna double check. Okay, I think so. It's on. Nope. Yeah, I think number five. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Four, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what will happen to Slavery? Right? Okay. Uh, no, oh, this okay. is um, no, this is ambitious mitigation scenario surface. Or maybe ambition. I didn't have a poll for it. Okay. Uh, there, yeah, there is a. Can we trust climate models? Is, okay. That's question. Sorry. Yeah. Question. All right. Uh, so that's in one second. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, anyway, hopefully you had a chance to think about it, and here's the kind of snapshot. So as you can see, and perhaps that's surprising to some people. So sea level rise continues to expand in RCP 8.5 as expected, like we have ice sheet melt, we have expansion of thermal, thermal expansion of the ocean. But in this uh, RCP 2.6, it also continues to, uh, to increase, actually. Um, so what's very interesting is that ocean has such a big inertia, so it's so difficult to change kind of like anything in it because it's so big that once you get it warming, it's going to continue to expand and continue to kind of like increase in sea level rise. Uh, until you actually remove like a huge amount of negative emissions. So even though like maybe temperature, as you could see, was kind of more reactive, like it was almost zero, like started to decline in some regions, sea level rise actually continues to increase quite a lot. Uh, so it's a lot more resistant to our, in a way, mitigation actions than temperature. All right, so now based on the questions, uh, sorry, the results we just saw from different climate models in terms of warming, in terms of sea level rise, a general question to you is like, can we trust climate models? Do you think those projections are correct? Like, can you, do you actually trust them? So like, let's see, what do you think of that? So there's a little, there's a tiny lag. So it'll take a second for some results to come in, but here we go. And Dr. Tarkarska, we can also circle back at the end if we want to take a look at, at the results again of any polls when, when more people have answered and we. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so this is really interesting as well. So, actually, okay, it's about half half. So, how about the climate models and how do people think? Uh, uh, which is quite nice. Nobody thinks it's the answer is no, which I'm quite glad to see. Oh, actually, more, more people are now for maybe, but that's um, that's quite interesting. And let's see, um, let's see what is further evidence for that. Um, so I have like a question, kind of like there's a very interesting analogy from this kind of like um, article by uh, Professor Reto Knuti in Climatic Change, and it refers to like a garden party. Um, so imagine you're planning a garden party and this actually is a trillion dollar party uh, in terms of like our climate change. But like just now imagine like you're, you're planning like your own garden party and you're trying to decide should you hold it just in your garden as it is or should you kind of put a tent over it. And if you put a tent over it, it's not going to be as nice because it's kind of like inside a tent. But then also in case it rains, the tent is really useful. So you kind of have to decide, do you want your party to be kind of less cool with the tent? Or do you want to kind of gamble and like hold the garden party even though it might rain, right? So what you want to do, you want to actually check the answer, like, is it going to rain or not during my party time, right? And how do you check for the answer? So you can like read the newspaper or like see uh, maybe the new news in terms of like weather projections. And it tells you like maybe there's a 40% chance of rain. Uh, then you can ask your neighbor who is maybe a farmer and he kind of has a better idea of like how the weather behaves in this region and you can kind of get an expert opinion from your neighbor in terms of do you think it's going to rain during my party time uh, and then you can kind of also just look yourself at the sky and see oh, okay I think the sky is kind of looking a bit gloomy maybe I should pull up the tent right so you have different lines of evidence to determine your answer right like the, some of them are probabilistic some of them are like just observation based so there's different lines of evidence and that's kind of exactly like what we do with climate modeling we don't just like develop one model that's going to have oh here's data here's like some processes and some physics and here's the output we use different lines of evidence to arrive to those answers and the, the reason why it's called like a trillion dollar party because it's kind of the same process but instead of deciding should you hold the barbecue or not uh, or with the tent or no tent 
you, we actually trying to predict global climate and climate change impacts, which overall could could have very high financial values uh, as much as a trillion dollars if those impacts are very severe, right? Uh, so that's why we want to make sure those projections are as correct as possible. And in order to do that, you don't want to trust on one line of evidence. So like all models are wrong, but some of them are useful, right? So you want to run different models. You want to also have like different lines of evidence from the observations, from physics-based kind of expert opinion and put it all together and like see what's the answer in the end, right? Like not Hi everyone. Uh, we seem to be having a small problem. Uh, our instructor's video froze. <laughs> uh, we'll go to a quick break uh, and we'll be uh, back soon. Sorry, I think my Zoom got crashed, but can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect, I'm just going to get started. I think this was the slide we disappeared on. Okay, um, yeah, so can we trust climate models? So as I was uh, saying before, we calibrate the climate models against the historical period. We also, because some of the historical period might be um, like uh, missing observations or maybe the data is incomplete, we also use different lines of evidence. So you can use historical observations of temperature or precipitation as recorded by different kind of meteorological stations records. But you can also use ice cores and then kind of get uh, like deep long-term past of the climate information from ice core information. Um, we compare different range of climate models to see how they vary in output. So if most models show one thing and another model shows completely different response, you can kind of think, okay, why this one model is different? Is it because maybe the physics scheme is different and so on? And, and then kind of try to explain those differences. Is this different for a good reason or not, right? Um, and then also like if one climate model overestimates or underestimates historical period, like you can kind of expect this bias to be continued into the future. So despite of all those limitations, climate models actually have been remarkably accurate in predicting climate change in response to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so because we take this kind of like multi-evidence approach, right? We don't just run single climate model, we run multiple climate models, they are verified against various things. In the end, the response is actually remarkably accurate. And that's why um, there was, I think in the, um, Last year or the previous year, actually, uh, there was three Nobel Prize winners who were the pioneers of the field of the climate modeling. Um, so they developed this kind of physics-based climate models in like the about like 30 years ago. And the projections they made in those initial research 30 years ago, right now, are like um, on the spot with what they were projecting using this kind of physics-based models. So we know the physics really well. We also know like those different lines of evidence and we cross verify those models. Um, so I think uh, the answer to the question is like, can we trust climate models? It definitely should be like, yes, we can like definitely be careful, like how you, uh, you know, uh, how you interpret the output, be aware of all the uncertainties in it. But like overall, we can get the trends very well. M what maybe those models are like, they of, of course have some limitations in like maybe pr projecting precipitation in some like regions that are difficult to model. But like overall, we are quite confident that those models are showing us uh, robust climate responses in the future. 
And feel free to check out this article from National Geographic, actually, about the Nobel Prize winners in climate modeling. Uh, it's very interesting to read. Um, so as we kind of go on forward, I think the last part of the first uh, section of this lecture, which was like the kind of basic of climate modeling and climate physics, is going to be about carbon emissions and like kind of like how does it all play with the climate responses we get from the climate models. Um, so now you know there's different emission scenarios and you can put it into the model and the model tells you how much warming is going to happen globally and regionally, how much other like sea level rise and other climate responses are happening. Um, so the question we have now here is uh, how much time do we have left until one and a half degree warming? Um, so you know that there's like the Paris Agreement target that was mentioned on Tuesday in Evan's lecture um, about uh, like keeping warming to well below two degrees and possibly close to one and a half degrees. Uh, so how much time do we have left until that? So let's see what the poll says. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Okay. Uh, okay. Right, so it's quite interesting. So a lot of people think it's about five to 10 years. Some people think it might be 10 to 20 and some people think it's 20 to 30. Um, so I think, um, yeah, let, let me just one second. Let me just reshare my screen and we can. All right, um, so the answer is actually, so there's an intro, uh, sorry, I need to share it first, okay. Uh, share screen. So the answer actually can be found on, in the IPCC report, which probably will be the best place to go, but there's also this kind of climate clock, which um, used to use IPCC data to kind of estimate it. So the global warming to date observed is 1.27 degrees. So we don't have much left until 1.5, right? And actually, oh, sorry, until 1.5 degrees, this leaves us about eight years at the present day of emission rate. So if we continue emissions at present rate and we do nothing, but we don't increase them, but we also don't do any mitigation, we have about eight years left. Of course, it really depends on like the emission rate. So if we start mitigation immediately, then this time will be longer. So I think the question, the answer is again, like it depends how fast we mitigate, but based on our previous behavior that like those emissions are really quite not mitigated at the rate they should be. Um, like the, in a sense, like business as usual scenario, we just continue doing what we do, it's about eight years left. And again, just uh, remembering that because of this kind of like uh, variations in the climate system, the year to year temperature global mean might not be indicative of reaching Paris Agreement target because you can like be very high temperature due to El Nino or very low temperature due to La Nina. So what we want to do is to, Kind of see like what's the like long-term temperature over the trend and is the trend above one and a half or two degrees okay uh so if we now think okay we want to actually limit global warming at one and a half degrees can we stop emissions today and what's going to happen if we like let's assume it's quite unrealistic but everybody stops emissions today on the entire planet what would happen to temperature and sea level rise uh, so let's launch another poll and see what the answers are for that. Okay. So this is the question, what will happen? And yes, here come the responses. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect, yep. okay. Okay, so it's interesting. If we stop emissions today, what will happen to temperature and sea level rise? Let, let's see what more people think. Okay, so actually it looks like a lot of people think both will increase and some people think both will remain unchanged. Like there's a variety of answers and to be fair, it's actually a tricky question. So we can see, let's see what happens. Um, okay. Um, so let's see. 
This is a simulation using a climate model. So as you can see, temperature is increasing as it is right now. And then you can kind of like have a scenario where, okay, emissions are stopped today. This is what happens to temperature. So temperature actually may slightly decrease, but overall kind of remains constant. You can see like it kind of goes down, up and down, up and down, but like overall the trend is close to zero. So you could say actually temperature is uh, not changed plus minus tiny bit, but like overall the trend is kind of close to zero. What happens to sea level rise? You can see sea level rise in the same simulation actually continues to increase. And this is because of all this like ocean thermal inertia, right? Like because the ocean is warm, even though like you were warm already, it's already expanding. You stop temperature increase, but the ocean continues to expand, right? Um, so you can see maybe the rate here is higher and then the rate here is lower, but it continues to expand. And um, again, this really shows us that like temperature is relatively straightforward. Like if we increase emissions, it increases more. If we decrease emissions, it kind of like reacts fast and it might actually decline if we were removing emissions. But thermosteric sea level rise and other components of the climate system like ice sheets, they wouldn't be as responsive. So they continue to change and like decline, for example, or increase um, despite changes in emissions and temperature. So I think what really this tells us is firstly, it's quite difficult to model a climate system, right? Because of all these different feedbacks causing sometimes nonlinear reactions. And secondly, that like some of the changes are more reversible than others and some changes might be quite irreversible. So like in order to stop sea level rise to be constant or even decrease, you actually have to remove quite a bit of carbon from the atmosphere and same with for the ice sheets. And so this kind of uh, slide uh, based on uh, this paper um, shows us kind of what happens also when emissions are stopped and you can see like CO2 in the atmosphere kind of goes down, right? Because you stop emitting CO2 to the atmosphere, ocean and land still continue to take up carbon. So you have a decline in atmospheric CO2, but then you can see like surface warming kind of continues to be mostly constant and ocean sea level continues to rise. So it's quite irreversible, regardless of like the various levels of CO2 you stop it at. Uh, and then again, like because stopping emissions is not enough, in order to get to the one and a half degree target, uh, most likely we will not only have to kind of stop emissions, but also have negative emissions in a sense. So like we need to, uh, everybody needs to stop emissions, get to net zero as much as they can, but we might also need to remove some of the emissions from the atmosphere in order to actually stabilize the climate at like uh, very safe, like low levels of warming. Um, and that's what brings us kind of this negative emissions. So, oh, sorry, that resolution is not too good. Um, so for example, there's a direct air capture, right? Like you can kind of like have this, either Climeworks is one of the key providers right now, like uh, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, or like you can have like this kind of artificial trees, right? Where you put CO2 through it, like from the air, and then it captures carbon from the atmosphere. Um, as you can see about it, like it's a very expensive technology and it requires a lot of energy, right? Because CO2 is a very dilute gas. So it's not so much of it in the atmosphere. Like, like it has a huge impact, but per unit of air, there's very little CO2. So you actually have to push a lot of air through it in order to, to capture some carbon. Uh, again, like there can be afforestation or reforestation efforts. Um, and that may be a good solution, but maybe are not as permanent, right? Because maybe some of this forest might uh, capture wildfire and then release CO2 back to the atmosphere. Or maybe if this afforestation is happening uh, in regions where it shouldn't, like, or kind of interfering in food supply or indigenous regions, maybe that's not a good solution, right? Uh, we can also have a biochar, which is kind of like a technology of enhancing like uh, soil, capturing carbon, and then like putting this car captured carbon into the soil. So it kind of like um, has additional effect of like storing it. Uh, fertilization of the ocean, making the ocean take up more CO2. That might be highly controversial, right? Because the ocean is so big and the, the ocean ecosystem is also so big that you can't just change part of the ocean. Like this whole system is very connected. So even if you want to try changing a tiny bit of the ocean, like that whatever you do, it might actually spread across the globe. So this, any sort of like ocean fertilization might be of a very high risk because we might not know necessarily what those changes will happen. Uh, enhanced weathering. So kind of, again, like uh, kind of uh, putting CO2 into the kind of soil and then biomass combustion of carbon capture and storage, which is um, kind of like combusting uh, trees that capture CO2 but then using filters on the chimney. So you don't release this combusted CO2 to the atmosphere, but you actually can like aggregate it and then like again, store it in some way. Uh, so again, like we do have several technologies with various levels of risk and various levels of controversy or not, uh, and various costs also to remove carbon from the atmosphere. 
And my question then is like, can we deploy it on large scale? Can it actually the geological storage is it like certain? Can we use bioenergy plus CCS, right? Like with the BCSS, is it like a good uh, solution depending on the region? Some of them might be very highly costly. And there's also this moral risk of postponing climate change actually indefinitely, right? Because if you think, okay, well, we can remove it later. Why should we do something now? Because it's expensive to do it now. That way you can kind of get like this lack of momentum in mitigation. And as you can see, we already are like 1.2 degrees above uh, pre-industrial times and 1.5 is the limit. So like we're really close to the limit. So I think um, it's quite difficult to be like postponing the climate action right now. Um, and just to kind of end this first part of the lecture on a bit more positive note, I just want to leave you with this uh, kind of image, uh, which is from the kind of journal Popular Mechanics in 1954. Um, and you can kind of read what they were talking about the computer. They were thinking that the first computer will not be feasible. Like maybe it's like too complicated. There's no way it's going to work. But like 15 years later, like, I mean, pretty much everybody has a computer, right? Uh, so it actually, maybe we really need like some new technologies or we need like a huge acceleration in the technologies in order to really help us to reach those net zero. And like some of those technologies maybe exist already in early stage, but they just need more scaling. Uh, so I think I just want to like uh, leave it on a bit more positive note. And um, also just thinking, why is this important? Um, so if you see here, like the countries that contributed the least greenhouse gases are in, in blue and the countries that contributed the most greenhouse gases are in red. So you can see like North America, Europe kind of, um, Northern Hemisphere contributed majority of greenhouse gases and then also in, including Australia. And then as you can see, the impacts of climate change are the opposite picture. So most of Africa is blue, which uh, it means like it didn't contribute much greenhouse gases, but then the climate impacts vulnerability is really high and the climate impacts are also going to be quite high there. Uh, so you can see that's really unfair, right? The countries that contributed the most, like for example here, are not as impacted and not as vulnerable as the ones that didn't uh, contribute to climate change. So it's a very global issue. And that's why I think we need both local and global solutions to, to like really make it, um, make it work and solve it. Uh, so let's take a 10 minute break and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about like any technical or clarification questions for this first part of the lecture. And, and then the second part of the lecture will follow on ML applications. Uh, can we actually use machine learning model to, uh, to kind of model climate change? But like I first wanted to explain like the traditional approach, how do we use it using physics based models? So let's take a 10 minute break and let's meet at uh, well, let's meet at 12 minutes past the hour, whatever hour you're at right now. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Tukarska. And um, I do have one, I wanna relay one clarification question. So if others had this clarification question too, which is why do the low clouds have a higher albedo? Uh, they just happen to be brighter. So because of the climate physics, like because they are low, maybe that, I, I don't know exactly, I'm not an atmospheric physics expert, but like those clouds, like if you see lower clouds, they're usually brighter and that's why they have a high albedo and then the high clouds, maybe they're more rainy and they, they kind of like look more gray. I don't know, like, I think it's related to cloud physics, but I'm not an expert in it, but it's an interesting question. I'm happy to, yeah. yeah, might be good to research that. Um, okay. And the, there was one more clarification question. The impact of climate models, uh, how, to, how to measure the impact of climate models? Maybe I'm not, you can, might wanna save that for later or answer it now. Um, I, I think it's a bit unclear what it's meant by impact of climate models. Do you mean like okay. the climate change impact the models show you or do you mean the CO2 impact of modeling? Uh, so maybe yeah. this can discuss later and the person yeah. who wrote perhaps could clarify in the comments uh, what it's sure. meant. That's a great idea, thank you. Um, and also while we're on break, I do have the final so far poll results to show from all the polls. So I could just quickly go through those that way it will be on the live stream for posterity. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so we have, hold on, I'm gonna just rearrange my screen a little bit and share screen. Okay, whoops, sorry. Um, so 
here's I'll go through I'll walk through them one at a time briefly I'm not sure if you want to narrate any of this um or I can just um, yeah sure happy just to see like what the results are so I think the first question uh, do you think AI can be used for climate science and we got yeah a lot of enthusiastic responses like a lot it can be used and to some extent so I think it's it's quite a good a range of responses I think very few people said AI can replace climate science and hopefully by now you can see that it wouldn't be that easy for AI to fully replace climate science but Definitely there's areas um, and they could highly accelerate uh, either research or the models. So we'll talk about it more in the next uh, next section, yeah. All right, so what happens on that carbon uptake? Yeah, that was a tricky question because it really depends both on CO2 and temperature. So it's, it's good to see the spread of the responses depending uh, what assumptions you make in your answer, okay. Uh, what will happen to global mean sea level rise in, um, I think it was the ambitious mitigation scenario it seems like it's going to increase for most people so that's good because the sea level rise continues to increase yeah and what oh so yeah so yeah ambitious mitigation scenario what will happen to surface air temperature also a lot of people thought it will continue to increase decrease yeah so as you mm -hmm. can see like the change of it was very small it was generally zero because you were we were trying to stabilize the climate system in the in those experiments but the temperature could be slightly up or slightly down depending on the year yeah can we trust climate models? Uh, yes, no, maybe. So hmm. good to see most people are maybe, and yes, some people are no. So hopefully the slides clarify that we do have a lot of uh, lines of evidence and uh, reasons why we think the climate models are a good tool for projecting future climate change because they are robust uh, based on multiple like checks that we do to them. All right, and how much time is left until one and a half degrees? I think most people, yeah, five to 10 years is probably most realistic answer. 10 to 12 years, if you assume the mitigation is going to be happening quite rapidly now. And 30 to 20 to 30 years, that really uh, would be highly ambitious mitigation scenario, which um, possibly, like, most likely won't happen, but uh, would be nice if it happened. Yeah. I think there's oh sorry this is uh, oh, okay. this is out of order <laughs> that's okay i think yeah temperature and sea level rise so i think the answer here was if we stop emissions today temperature will remain unchanged but sea level continues to increase so like the purple answer and actually yeah some people got it right but not many like the last one sorry sorry the last one uh no pink pink one the last that's the last one. yeah temperature remains the same but the sea level rise increase only oh wow only one person got it right well well good that well done and hopefully now everybody has a better understanding of what would happen but again it was quite a tricky question mm -hmm. okay and it, there is one last poll which i think is for yes so that will be in by the end yeah. of the lecture mm -hmm. great thank you so much for that all right so we still have like i think four minutes and we're going to meet 12 minutes past the hour okay
All right. Well, hopefully uh, people had some time to take a little break and we can continue with the machine learning applications uh, to the field of climate science. Um, so first, like, I mean, as you probably know from the very first lecture of the summer school, like machine learning, and this is the definition from the Oxford uh, kind of dictionary, um, is the use of and development of computer systems that are able to learn and adapt without following explicit instructions uh, by using different algorithms and statistical models to analyze and draw inferences from patterns in data. So what's really important in this definition here that like we need some sort of data patterns and the machine learning algorithm will learn from this pattern and then try to infer the answers, right? So the strengths of this approach is like doing simple tasks quickly, finding different patterns and optimizing complex systems. But uh, you also get biases to kind of bad or biased data. They can be poor at generalizing if the data changes and also um, sometimes finds correlation, but not necessarily causation. And so I think if you now think about like application of this to the climate science, uh, you can identify some areas of challenges for using machine learning, right? Because um, for example, generalizing if data changes, like the past climate is quite different from the future climate we might experience. And there's so many things that are causing it to change, including like how much emissions do we emit or like what the climate policy will be like, what will be the regulations that determine if we follow this kind of business as usual scenario or if we follow ambitious mitigation scenario. So you can't really make inferences really easily into the future based on the past data alone, because this past data doesn't have this future information, right? Um, and again, like there's like a lot of patterns you could see on those climate science maps. So maybe machine learning um, can um, identify those patterns, but then again, like be quite uh, careful how to interpret it and how to interpolate it. Uh, so yeah, so like the climate change impact that a lot of people are kind of researching using climate models and also like now increasingly also using machine learning would be climate change impacts uh, related to severity and frequency of storms, droughts, fires, flooding, extreme heat. So like different climate hazards uh, and also like the different feedbacks like permafrost top, but also cloud feedback, carbon cycle feedback. You can also use uh, use models to kind of try to quantify the feedbacks and also like remembering that the impacts of climate change are uneven. So this uh, entire climate system is highly nonlinear. It doesn't like easily respond to, like if one thing increases, another thing can either increase or decrease depending on other conditions. Um, and then we also know uh, from the previous uh, side of the lecture that we do need uh, to reach a net zero greenhouse gas emissions in order to stabilize uh, warming at one and a half degrees. And in order to do that, um, we would kind of need to not only stop emissions, but also possibly like remove some emissions from the atmosphere if we really want to reach one and a half degrees. Uh, and there's also a lot of need for like monitoring and kind of like uh, management of those different solutions. And some of those were already mentioned on the Tuesday lecture on the AI for carbon verification. Um, so just looking purely at like the machine learning and climate predictions, there's a very nice perspective in nature, which is called deep learning and process understanding for data-driven earth system science. And you can kind of see how they compare different machine learning tasks to earth science tasks. So for example, you can see like different patterns in data. So this is like a map of climate system. And like, for example, different patterns in the ocean current or, or atmospheric CO2, depending on what this image is showing. And you can kind of like identify similar type of images. So like treat the climate system up as an image. Another way to kind of uh, manipulate this data it's uh, using the computer vision algorithms for super resolution and data fusion. So when you have a picture of a person that is maybe very blurry, you can kind of recover a very high resolution picture. And like similarly, maybe you have a first map, the one in the background you can see is very kind of high, uh, low resolution in a way because the squares are quite big. So yeah, and higher square might be like 100 by 100 kilometers. And then you can use some sort of machine learning to increase granularity of this data to make it more accurate. And similarly, you can kind of use maybe like video prediction techniques in order to do some sort of short term to forecasting, because as you, as you could see, like the one video we're watching, the temperature changes over time given different conditions. So maybe some sort of of those techniques could be used. And also language translation, like kind of like what are the different like dynamic uh, time series modeling and like kind of like using a lot of time series analysis uh, to implement into the climate science research. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of potential where machine learning could be used um in the applications of climate science so we're going to kind of uh, look into a few examples of how various researchers have used that recently uh, so the first one which actually this is the most relevant one from the tutorial uh, that is going to be uh, on tuesday office hours for it are on tuesday, next monday um regarding forecasting um of various events so like for example a nino forecasting 
it's kind of like an oscillation, right? Which you have tem it causes increases and decreases of temperature. And you could use some sort of time series, perhaps, or offer like new networks to, to do some of the forecasting. Uh, so machine learning can be quite accurate for the near term forecasting, especially the shorter the time, the more accurate it can be, right? And, and it will be probably more accurate than those big climate models. Uh, because on the short term uh, time scales, you can like use a lot of information from the near term observations to inform your near term future. But then you also need to be aware of the limitations at what uh, like at what time scales machine learning is no longer accurate, right? Because again, like you, you have different emission scenarios, you have different kind of social economic impacts in the future, and like at some point, machine learning would need some uh, some additional data sources because it needs to know what happens to emissions in the year twenty thirty. Like it won't be easy to interpret it based on the observations only right now, right? Um, there could be like also like the, some other oscillations like. Uh, uh, Mad and Julian oscillation predictions, or like now casting of precipitation. Uh, there has been like several algorithms recently uh, shown that you can really well predict precipitation in the very near term. Um, there's also lots of active research for actually forecasting agricultural yield because again, it's quite difficult to capture. It's because it depends on several things, not only climate, but also economics and like other things. So it's kind of like very variable and also extreme event forecasting, right? So like if you want to know when is the next heat wave going to happen, uh, you kind of like um, potentially you can use like the power of machine learning in increasing like accuracy of the near time forecasting, but you also need to kind of know are the heat wave conditions going to be like kind of like modeled well in this machine learning model. So there's like just several of papers uh, published recently about like different skillful projections of whether it's precipitation, a linear oscillation, or some other oscillations, or also crop yields. Uh, so you can kind of see that this field is very active and there's a lot of ideas of how you could actually do it. And there's also actually, for example, in industry, there's lots of interest in it as well, including like the climate AI startup, uh, where they use specifically like uh, machine learning for agriculture, kind of like yield modeling. Um, so another one, which was just mentioned earlier as well, will be downscaling to find a resolution. Um, so again, like if you have a climate model, like if it's physics based climate model, if you want it at high resolution, it's going to take a very long time to compute it, right? Because then each of the grid cell needs to talk to each other, needs to have the carbon, uh, energy, water, like all these kind of conservations processes. So the smaller the grid cells are, like the longer it will take you to compute all those processes. Um, so one way to kind of find a balance between these two was, would be to use like a a medium resolution model that like has 100 by 100 kilometers grid cells, it models all the processes, everything is conserved. And then you kind of downscale this kind of cross like big resolution to much more granular one. Um, so there's a lot of, again, algorithms for doing it. You can use it for downscaling precipitation and temperature it works quite well. Um, you can also downscale uh, climate changes over mountain regions or like challenging topography, right? Because if you have a mountains in one grid cell, like uh, it might be quite difficult to have it in a climate model, right? Because you don't have this resolution to actually have mountains in a specific region, but you can kind of like uh, use downscaling techniques to, to get it there. Um, and one uh, paper that I found specifically interesting, like, so actually it's a variety of methods. You can use convoluted neural networks for kind of downscaling, but you could also use like a um, kind of encoder and decoder um, architecture as well. Um, in terms of like kind of uh, latent linear adjustment autoencoder. So there's like various methods and various algorithms that are being used to kind of create the downscaling of the climate map. Um, another area of um, simulations would be accelerating simulations. So just like making sure that those climate models that we have that are physics based, they're accelerated and like uh, computing things faster. And specifically what's very useful is a cloud emulator. So you could have still like entire global climate uh, model that is physics based, but then you replace the cloud module, which maybe takes too long to compute. Like you want to compute all those load lights, how clouds and everything. Maybe you can put machine learning emulator only for clouds and then link it together with the rest of the climate model, which is physics based. So it's kind of called hybrid modeling that you use both physics based model and some parts are machine learning and you kind of link them together. And same for vegetation emulation. So like, it's really difficult to kind of uh, model the physics of plants in a sense, because there's so many parameters, right? And like sometimes we don't even know exactly what's the plant sensitivity to certain things. So maybe you can use like a machine learning based approach that you have some observations about the plants. You try to buy a vegetation emulator and you put this vegetation emulator together with this physics-based climate model, link them, 
And then you, you get hybrid results because some parts are machine learning based, but a lot of things are physically based. So you, so you kind of get benefits of both of the models. And that's a very promising, I think, area as well. And you can kind of use it like, again, like for, for cloud simulation, vegetation, and like some other applications as well. Uh, so I think this really brings us to the most exciting part for me, which is like this kind of physics info machine learning, which exactly like you take physics-based climate models, but you also take some of the observational products like temperature, data, carbon observations, and you use machine learning model to inform better your physics-based model. So actually these arrows should be kind of going both ways. Um, and this approach, the benefit of it is that you can still have some sort of conservation of carbon, of water, of energy, and then you use machine learning model to either improve individual components of the climate system, such as clouds or vegetation, or to accelerate some processes. So if there's like a simple physics process that takes a really long time to compute, maybe you can have a machine learning algorithm that accelerates the process. Um, so the benefit of using this hybrid approach, again, is like making sure that you can have some sort of conservation um, of carbon, energy, or water in your system. Because if you only use machine learning and observational data, again, you're kind of missing all this, um, firstly, the conservation loss in the climate system, how things are connected with this nonlinear feedbacks. And secondly, you're missing kind of the future emissions uh, pathways, which are being fed into the physics-based climate models. Uh, so this, again, like hybrid modeling and physical constraints, it's a very active area of research. Um, so that there's a need for predictions that are robust on longer time scales and physically consistent. And uh, specifically, like a lot of people call it physically informed neural networks or PINN, so like PIN, um, or physical constraints that are being hard coded into machine learning architectures. Um, so you can kind of use this different hybrid atmospheric models, so again, including atmospheric variability, because atmosphere is like very kind of like uh, a lot of processes in the atmosphere and the cloud specifically are really difficult to compute. Um, so maybe you kind of want to use some hybrid approach there for cloud emulators, even for wildfire modeling, because wildfires are also quite hard to parameterize directly, right? You can have a model that kind of approximates some things there, but maybe you can learn from the observations, have a machine learning model for the wildfires and then link it with the uh, the physics-based climate system model. So there's like a lot of use of specific like various neural network ar architectures where you would either kind of like implement the, the physical constraint in your output. So basically like whatever the neural network produces, you kind of use a sense check, like does this result make sense or not based on some sort of conservation loss? Or you could have like a hard-coded constraint that is directly into the neural network architecture where um, like the way the neural network computes things is uh, such that it obeys those like conservation of carbon, water, or energy equations. And that way, maybe this model will be like not as accurate as like a purely black box model based on data in, data out. But the benefit of this hybrid approach with physical constraint is that your longer term responses might be more robust because they actually try to like in a sense emulate some of this physics in the climate system. As you could see, like it's quite a complicated system to model, right? Uh, so again, like, so you can have like kind of three objectives in machine learning products for observational constraints. Uh, so like you want to develop firstly at the bottom, like the model, but uh, which can be like both data driven. And like, you kind of want to make sure like you also have some sort of physical constraints and you evaluate them and benchmark them. So you don't want to have like a black box approach. You also want to make sure this approach is interpretable. Um, so like you want to see like what's the feature importance of the different key inputs, what key regions are important for making robust projections, right? And like the conceptual understanding. So if you use machine learning models or like components of the model in your climate model, do those things make sense? Like, are you learning from the right regions? So you could see for the, for example, for the global warming response, a lot of warming is happening in the Northern hemisphere because of the, the way the air circulates, right? Like around the globe. And if your model is learning from some regions that, that are not uh, important, for example, for this process, then maybe you're like learning from the noise, you're not learning from the signal. So just like making sure you understand physically where's the main signal happening, uh, and then like learning from the correct regions. And for, again, like for each of the climate components, like sea level rise or ice sheets, the signal might be different, right? So just understanding a bit of physics behind that. And then also like prediction and uncertainty quantification. So I think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? I guess, um, and there's the saying, so you want to make sure you don't just have one model necessarily. Maybe you want to have an ensemble of different models and you want to constrain the uncertainty to ranges. Or you want to make sure you also compare the responses to the observations. So can your model perform well on the historical climate and then you can implement it into the future? 
Uh, so just kind of like uh, understanding really how those different things come into play. Um, so just like to summarize this section, like machine learning is only one piece of the puzzle and it's a powerful tool, but it's not a silver bullet, right? So it's not necessarily relevant to every problem, but it can be helpful if you actually apply it in the right places. So that's why it's kind of like really important to collaborate it. So if you are a data science expert, like you don't necessarily maybe want to start playing with climate data alone, like maybe get in touch with some climate expert who's interested in it as well. And you can kind of collaborate together because that way you'll make sure like the choices you make and then data inputs you make are more like, uh, like better choices that lead to more robust results rather than just kind of treating this data as like, oh, this is like a big data source, but you don't actually know what part of this data is useful versus not. So there's again, like several perspectives that kind of describe the different uh, use cases where machine learning could be very promising in the climate modeling field, but also where machine learning uh, may be not necessarily the best idea, right? And then again, like from this, uh, so this is uh, from this nature perspective from Marcus Rackstein and uh, colleagues, uh, which again uh, shows the different architectures where the physics informed machine learning and hybrid modeling can be useful for. Uh, so, so this is maybe a bit more complicated, but like again, like you can kind of like start from the inputs here, like past observations of different temperature fields. Then you go into like, for example, convolution on your network, and then like some other constraints of physical wrapping model, and then you can make predictions based on uh, this kind of like physically informed results. So that's one way to do it. Or another way would be to deep code the physical constraint into the neural network architecture or some other algorithm architecture. And depending on which algorithm you use for that. Um, so we can launch our last poll question, which is, can we use machine learning models to predict climate change in the year 2050? Well, let's see what, um, what the answers are for this poll question. All right, so that's actually interesting to see. Like a lot of people say yes or maybe, and some people say no. <clears throat> and I think, again, like that would be my personal view on this question, but I think the answer is definitely not yes, because as we just mentioned, machine learning is good for interpolating based on the past trends in data or data patterns. But because by the year 2030, there's so much uncertainty in the emissions, and we don't know exactly like, are we going to follow the business as zero scenario? Are we going to follow ambitious mitigation scenario? The machine learning model trained on the past data might not necessarily know uh, what the emissions will be over the, the coming future data. So unless you feed those emissions somehow different scenarios to the machine learning model and like run different kind of like cases, like, okay, for those future emissions and for these future emissions, what's the future climate change? Um, it might not be necessarily the best case. I think the answer here would be like, probably maybe, because I think there's a lot of uh, interest and also like promise in this hybrid modeling where you could still use like a physics-based climate model <clears throat> to which you feed in those different emission scenarios. And then you could see how the climate change changes under those different scenarios by use machine learning models to like accelerate some of the processes to make your model perform faster and also to make your model um, high resolution. Sorry, I'm just a bit confused here. Okay, let me share it again. Uh, I think it's this one, okay. So I think the answer is maybe, but like it really, again, depends on the use case and just be really careful with pure machine learning project projections because uh, sometimes they might be interpolating for the wrong reasons or the answers might not be necessarily robust. Uh, so here is like a summary, it's not exhaustive of different machine learning applications to climate science. So I think a lot of them I just mentioned in those few examples before. And um, the one that you'll be specifically focusing on in the tutorial is kind of like the climate variability short term to sub-seasonal forecasting, which is the ENSO oscillation. And there'll be the tutorial on uh, with office hours next Monday. Uh, I, I exp like I will explain more by the end of this lecture about like the physics behind it, like kind of like what you're trying to model. And then you can play with it and then you can ask any questions you have 
on Monday in terms of like the modeling approach uh, for predicting El Nino based on the climate data. But there's a lot of also, yeah, like applications for extreme events forecasting, for example, there's a very promising area because extreme events are very rare. So we don't have much observations of them. And when, when they are happening, they have very high impact. So it's important to predict them well, but you don't have much training data for it. And similarly, like downscaling of climate model output to final resolution, it seems to work well for temperature and precipitation using different algorithms. <clears throat> Maybe also detection attribution of climate change, so that kind of signal to noise detection and causality. Uh, for example, like understanding the drivers of climate changes, hybrid modeling, uh, so using machine learning in addition to physics-based climate models, and many more application areas in this field. Uh, and in addition to it, there's like several papers I would highly recommend like reading if you're really interested in this area. Um, have a look, especially at the perspective papers, because they list lots of different areas of applications. And then you can choose what you're more interested in. Are you more interested in like downscaling and making really accurate results? Or are you more interested in like maybe um, kind of time series predictions or like some other of those applications? Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm going to talk about the, a bit of the climate data landscape. Uh, so some of like a lot of the climate data is publicly available online. Um, the main source of climate data, it's kind of called like CMIC 5 and CMIC 6 models, which is those temperature maps, sea level maps, precipitation maps uh, for both for the past climate and for the future climate as modeled by those physics based models. And um, it's all like on the ESGF server. But if you just Google Pangeo, which is kind of like an open source effort, uh, that put all those models into kind of like a czar arrays that are easy to manipulate. Uh, so basically, if you look for like CMIC 6 or CMIC 5 data and like possibly the Python, Pangea, you'll be able to find lots of these data sets. However, as I told you, like there's a lot of models and like some of them perform better than others. So like before really you get started, perhaps I like, get in touch with climate scientists to help you to understand better like which models to use for which use case and like why there's a lot of data there. So like which data is actually useful. Uh, for whatever question you're trying to answer. Um, there's also ECMWF data, which is kind of more um, reanalysis of the historical and near-term predictions. So if you're doing, for example, ENSO or like some other like near-term um, questions like for precipitation now casting, this might be a really good data source to have a look. Um, and again, there's also Cordex, which is uh, downscaled climate models. Uh, so they are more finer resolution. So for example, if you're doing a downscaling algorithm, you might want to get CMIC 5 or CMIC 6 data and then see the downscaled codex data using like physics kind of statistical methods. And that could be your, in a way, training and cross-validation sets or like kind of like compare is your algorithm performing better with downscaling compared to the codex data, for example, which would be the output. Um, there's lots of remote sensing data from like uh, satellite observations, both from the SFP lab and NASA climate data sets. Um, if you really want to learn more about like how to understand those climate data sets, the NCAR climate data guide does a really good job explaining how to understand the temperature map, what does it actually show, what time series it is for over the time period and so on. Uh, and there's also this kind of machine learning um, data set, which is called Climate Bench. So it uses the data from the scenic models, but it already kind of like cleaned it all up and you can use it directly for training machine learning models. So if you just want to learn some machine learning algorithms, maybe that's a good starting point, unless you want to, to kind of like have a very raw data, which is the first one here. <clears throat> so based on this, yeah, I also list some additional resources, which is kind of like maybe articles, uh, GitHub repos that I found quite useful, and uh, in general, kind of like things you might find useful in doing research on related CMIC models. Uh, so let's take the next few minutes uh, for discussion and Q&A. And then maybe let's leave uh, five minutes towards the end of the lecture. Uh, and then the last five minutes are just spent over discussing the tutorial related to this lecture. And then the kind of office hour for the tutorial will be on Monday, if that makes sense. OK. I just need like one minute to get some more water, but I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. So that was a great. Um, a great huge chunk of material from Dr. Uh, Tukarska. And um, thank you for posting all your questions on the, uh, on the community space. We're just um, reading them all over and I'll probably group them into two broad categories. We'll talk about machine, re machine learning related questions and then separately some um, questions related to the climate science. 
Um, so when she gets back, we'll dig right into that. There's still time to add your questions and definitely um, indicate if there's a question that's already there that you would really like to hear the answer to. All right, I'm back. Okay. So would you like us to start with the questions related to climate or the questions related to machine learning? Uh, I think we can do a mix. I mean, whatever makes sense, I think, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so actually one of the most popular questions is about this idea of you using huge compute to build um, like a really big, for example, Microsoft has a planetary computer to mimic the whole earth. And I think Europe is making an earth's replica and NVIDIA announced an earth's replica. Can you talk a little bit about these if this is the direction that climate tech should be um, should be going and to, to do their best for mitigation and or adaptation? Um, so yeah, I'm going to answer from my very personal view because it's my personal view. And again, my background is in physics-based climate modeling. So I think what we were trying to say during the lecture is, uh, in order to provide that the results are robust, you don't necessarily want to have one model. You want to have like maybe several models that are built quite differently, but they are all cross verified. And then you take the like the ensemble mean or like the mean model result. And um, so I would be uh, like, I'm a great fan of like physics based models that are being enhanced by machine learning. So if you use it like in a cloud scheme or vegetation scheme, um, I think there's a huge area for improvements because the models we have right now, even though maybe like in the latest IPCC report that came out last year and the previous year, um, all the CMIC 6 models and CMIC 5 models we have, they're all physics based. And they're quite accurate. They have their pros and cons and like kind of biases, but we understand those biases and we can make quite robust projections with them. So I'm personally not a fan of machine learning only model because I think exactly for those reasons that you would still need to learn the physics somehow. It's not just observing the climate system. Like you could maybe make, make near time projections, but you somehow need to input those emissions, the social economic changes. And again, you can make projections maybe five years forward, it's okay. 10 years or more, you're gonna run into like those missing things because they are not in the past. Like those things are future scenarios. So unless there's like some way you can kind of like include future scenario data, um, that computational effort might be like really good for near-term projections, but might not be as good for future projections. And then I just wanted to like also recognize that like if you read this article from National Geographic on like the climate uh, climate science Nobel Prize winners, uh, it's quite fascinating that they use very simple models that you could like literally compute on like your local computer. And like the, the numbers they got were quite accurate anyway. So like the trends were right, like they got the physics right. So while adding more computing resources and adding more granularity, yes, you can get like slightly better results, but overall the results are still the same, right? So it's in a sense, I don't think it's like a step change in like changing our like, oh, this is gonna be way better. It's just, yes, it might be more accurate, more granular, but then the question is like, is this worth the trade off? Like, do we actually really need it? Like, oh, what's really the value added? So it's really depends on the use cases, right? So if you're really trying to model something very in detail on a very small scale maybe that's the right use case maybe a hybrid model like i'm a great fan of the hybrid modeling like having a climate model uh, that is later than i could link it with machine learning model in like some smart ways maybe that's a choice uh, so again like i mean the time will show what's the use case of it it's, it's an interesting field but also i just wanted to kind of like maybe put a few words of caution that like we already know the answers like we already know the long-term trends we already know from so like from the CMIC models, there's like about close to 100 models in the CMIC 6 archive that are physics based and they show different responses. You can like do lots of data analysis based on it. Um, so I think like it definitely can help us improve our understanding, but like, is this really worth the cost, like the additional computational cost of that? I am not sure at this point. Thank you. And so, there's a lot of interest in, in, machine, in the machine learning community around causality and causal modeling. Um, so someone's asking, how can we utilize causal models um, to understand climate change? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I am not an um, expert in this field, but if you message me on the platform, I'm happy to point you out to several people who are directly doing research in this. Um, 
And there are several research centers. And I think causality is also very interesting because it will also help with like detection and attribution of climate change, right? Like, so why things happen? And then you can kind of like also go towards like detection, like is it due to the climate change or is it due to natural impact? And this also links with climate litigation, right? Like so if at some point, big companies get charged with litigation for like, oh, you caused this climate change, this had this impacts, and this was because of you, and this was because of the climate change you caused, um, they might have like some financial implications. So I think, uh, and also like in terms of like just the pure science, like understanding how does the climate system work? So is the sea level rising because of warming or like how much because of warming, how much because of, change in acidification, how much because of changing carbon, right? So there's like a lot of processes happening and just being able to attribute the changes like and fractional changes to what's happening due to which uh, factor is very interesting from a science perspective as well. So there's lots of research on that, various causal methods, but I'm not an expert to elaborate further. Thanks. Um, yeah, but that, that, that leaves a lot of uh, different strings or paths to follow up on um, that are each interesting. Yeah, so, I think definitely. I think the, the kind of advice I would give, because there's so many applications within climate science alone, like it's really just first figuring out like what question you're trying to answer. Like, are you interested in causality, detection, attribution? Are you interested in your time forecasting? Are you interested in like kind of like downscaling? So like really pick the, the thing that really interests you. And then you can kind of look into like what techniques are being used. But um, I think the overview I was trying to give is like machine learning can be used in like many of those fields. So like, instead of thinking, how can I use a neural network for climate science modeling? You just think about like, well, what is the end use case? Like, what are you trying to do? And then kind of work backwards in terms of like, oh, what algorithm would work best for that use case? Um, and is there, um, there's a question about democratizing ML modeling globally. Uh, so sometimes these models are created by closed groups or organizations. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's being done or how, what else we can do to democratize um, the modeling process and make climate modeling more collaborative or more inclusive? Yeah, I, th I think open source uh, data and open source code is uh, the key for future research and collaboration. And I think there's actually increasing amount of open code and open data happening, um, even like from the source modeling. So like the, all the models and the data sources I presented, they're all like mostly open or like open for academic research purposes. Uh, so you can kind of like use that um, directly from different repositories. And there's a lot of now actually efforts like the Pangeo effort in the kind of uh, computing and climate science community to make this data usable. So not only you need to like the initial maybe file format, not everyone's familiar with, but they are trying to put it in formats that people can directly download it from the cloud and use it. Um, so I think definitely there, like at least from the climate science perspective, there's lots of open data sets to start working with and also a lot of open code. In fact, a lot of the papers, most recent ones that are being published is um, increasing amount of pressure also from different funding bodies that like if you publish paper, it has to have an open code attached to it and open data. So there's a lot of uh, places where you can kind of start doing research, uh, try to see what other people do and I kind of like maybe replicate the results to learn how it's done and then I kind of like improve on it or develop your own ways. Um, I'm not uh, an expert in like machine learning alone, which I think also there's the strength more towards open data, but hopefully both of them will become more open. And um, a, a related question that also relates to your, your lecture a couple of days ago, um, are there any free sources of data for reporting of GHG? You mentioned the CDP. Um, and is that free? And if not, are there any free sources? And this is specifically, okay. sorry for GHG. Okay. Um, I think the CDP database, you can look up some things as they are, and you can also like email the data sources because if it's for non-commercial use, like for research use, a lot of them would be happy to share probably. If it's for commercial use, then you kind of have to like ask for the licensing, right? So I think it really also depends. I would say most of the data, data sets I shared in both lectures are open for research use. Like if you want to just get it and like try to practice something, if you want to like then generate a product on it and sell it, then like you kind of have to be careful with the licenses and like maybe contact the data providers to, to figure that out. Okay. And so we have an upvoted question, which is about the accuracy of the data being collected. So at the sensor level, you know, some sensors, maybe they might have been affected by weather or human behavior. Um, there's just, you know, there's also, they can make mistakes, there can be errors. So um, how do you handle that? How do you deal with accuracy from these sensors? Um, I mean, that's, of course, uh, there's no perfect observations, right? Be like different observations might be like either not recorded or there was like too strong wind and like the measurements are off or something like that. But that's why you can also use multiple data sources, right? Like from 
multiple lines of evidence or multiple providers that use different ways of arriving to the same information. Uh, so even for, I think for temperature, we have a lot more kind of agreement across different data sources, um, how those measurements are kind of like made. So like you have measured data and then you kind of need to interpolate sometimes because you only have a station here and station here, but you kind of want to have like a coherent data set, right? So they use different statistical methods to interpolate between two different stations, like what the in-between values, right? Um, so it's kind of good to have multiple observational data sources and also to know that observations are also subject to uncertainty. So you shouldn't have like a single observation you're trying to make your machine learning model like predict directly. You know that different observational sources, they generally they show the same thing, right? Like we know the climate has been warming. We know this is the change in different components of the climate system. So the trends are the same, but maybe the magnitude or like the year to year variability slightly differs. So just like assume there's like some observational error and then like also your projection also, again, like uh, cannot be just tailored to a single number. Like you kind of want to like make sure that like it works regardless of which data set you use as your observations. And um, dovetailing on that, would you, uh, could you talk a little bit about how uncertainty calculations happen? Um, like some examples of. So um, there's two ways you can uh, calculate uncertainty, like on observations. Like if you think about it, like uh, the data set itself. So some data sets, like for example, hot crude for is a global mean temperature data set uh, by the kind of like UK um, research agency. And they publish actually hundred ensembles of it. So he's like, okay, this is the station data we had recorded. This is how we interpolate it. And we do like hundred different variations of it. So here's, and then like all of them look very similar. Like they're very similar, but that's how you can get like kind of uncertainty around it. So it's like uncertainty within a specific data set. And another way is you can use different data set providers. They use different methods, right? And then I compare across different data sets. So for temperature, like this hot grid four, there's uh, Berkeley Earth, which uses completely different methods. There's the ECMF, uh, ECMWF, like reanalysis. So you can kind of like use different sources. Some, sometimes just be careful that like they don't replicate the same method, but like compare them. And then you can kind of get like the uncertainty. Okay, so the temperature here is this much plus minus this much, right? So it gives you a range. Uh, I think for precipitation, it's actually more challenging because precipitation measurements are harder and also a bit more uncertain. So again, if you have completely two different data sets over the same region, you might see in a lot of regions, like if both of them agree and they say, okay, the precipitation in this region increases by this much, you're more confident. If two data sets from observation show, oh, one of them shows it gets drier, the other one shows it gets wetter, then of course you, it's a bit uncertain, right? Like, so you, like your uncertainty will be higher. So just being aware of it that like no observation is perfect, no model is perfect, but I just making the best use of it. Thank you. Um, so I have a few questions for you that are um, that are about the climate science. So uh, one person's asking, could creating artificial low clouds be a partial solution or would that lead to negative side effects? Um, that's an interesting question. I think that was actually proposed by some projects in like uh, some regions that I've heard of. But again, like being, um, I think anything that, like, that's my personal opinion, but like, I think anything that relates to like kind of altering uh, the climate system on a large scale is highly controversial, right? Because we don't know exactly what the impacts will be. So even if you emit something to the atmosphere, and then you create more clouds and then you have like, a, I don't know, like maybe low clouds and like cooling in that region. You don't know if this additional, whatever you emit is kind of pollution in a sense because it's an artificial thing in the atmosphere. What does it affect, like what effect it has, right? And like remembering uh, atmospheric circulation goes around the globe, right? So this thing you emit over your region, it might actually end up in the opposite region like just one day later. Uh, and then it might have a different effect there. So like, it's quite difficult to, to have a large scale solutions that emit anything to the atmosphere because of all this like climate system being so interconnected or maybe from the atmosphere that end up being like precipitated to land and has negative impacts on land right so really it would be quite difficult i think to to get those solutions approved because they are uh, like we don't know exactly the impacts and the same goes for like any sort of like large scale ocean kind of like alterations like uh, ocean is also a very connected system whatever you put into one piece of the part of the ocean it might end up in a completely different part of the ocean um, later on so you don't know exactly like all those impacts will be really difficult to predict um, that being said like there are some solutions that are uh, some solutions that are safer in a sense right like we know more the limitations of it and like we also know like what impacts it can have so like if it's like biomass combustion or like afforestation like it's a bit easier in a way to quantify the risk of doing it what mm -hmm. could go wrong versus like emitting something to the atmosphere and then can it, it can be like literally anywhere across the globe in the next day. And 
And someone's asking about seawater. They said, um, seawater is alkaline with a pH of 8.1. With more CO2 absorption, is it possible for seawater to turn acidic in the future? And then what, what would be some of the implications for marine life, food security, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that's already happening that seawater is becoming more acidic, right? So the alkalinity is already decreasing. And because seawater is becoming more acidic, acidic, first of all, actually the ocean can take up less CO2 because the more acidic ocean takes up less CO2. And then also exactly you have all these negative impacts on like uh, animals not being able to maybe like thrive in that water or like being uh, less productive. So one thing is as the ocean gets warmer, the temperature gets warmer. So maybe again, like some coral bleaching is happening because it's too warm already. And then secondly, if the water also becomes more acidic, then again, you get like additional negative impacts. And both of those changes make the ocean actually take up less carbon, not more. So it's kind of um, like, uh, in a way, waterfall effect of like one thing changing and like changing so many things. Um, there's a question here about using local um, homemade weather stations. Do you think those would be effectively employed um, for weather forecasting? And if so, like what, what is the kind of suitable modeling approach for using, um, let's say like less, re less research grade um, sensors? Um, that's an interesting idea. I am not entirely sure what's the kind of use case of it, because if you want to get like really accurate weather, I think satellite data would be the best picture because it gives you not only your local, but also your kind of like regional patterns. Because the, the thing you observe right now, maybe the pattern that's happening like 100 kilometers from now is going to affect you by the end of the day, right? So mm -hmm. um, having like a big, bigger picture, at least regionally, uh, gives you more information like what's to come. So I think like having like very localized measurements don't give you the whole information. Okay. Um, and someone is talking about um, SST in the Arctic Ocean. Is this something, so the, the question says that the models have failed to predict the, the doubling of SST in the Arctic. And could you talk about, are there any indicators that we should have been looking at to predict to predict this. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. Yeah, so just to clarify for everyone, SST is sea surface temperature. Uh, so in some regions, like the climate models might be not as accurate in predicting, like for example, sea surface temperature in the Arctic, maybe they show some warming, but the warming is happening a lot faster, for example. Um, so because you're modeling the entire climate system, it's really difficult to get every specific region right. And I think <clears throat> some models have biases. And in generally, we kind of use the rule like, okay, if one model is biased in one way and then another model is biased elsewhere, if you average them out, on average, you're correct. But if all models are biased in the same region, then you have a problem. So again, like I haven't studied uh, Arctic, Arctic uh, surface temperatures like in specific, uh, in specifics, but I think if you can see that all the models have like a bias in a specific region, you can then use bias correction techniques. So, you know, oh, I know all models are showing too much of the warming. So I'm going to like apply a correction based on the observations and then apply this correction also into the future. So that, that's one way to like bias correction techniques are, are one way to like make sure those models produce robust results. Okay, and we only have a few minutes left. I'm gonna squeeze in two more questions. I'm gonna ask them both at once um, because they're related. They're kind of about, okay, you'll see what they're about. Um, so the first question is, do we need to learn climate science in order to implement AI for tackling climate change? And the second question, which is kind of related is, I'm new to all this and do you, can you suggest an effective entry point, like a project that I could use to gain knowledge and gain expertise? Yeah, these are great questions. And I think, uh, I mean, I think, of course, it's quite difficult to be an expert in everything. So you, like, I'm a climate expert. I'm not a machine learning expert, so I'm learning machine learning uh, by use case. So if you're a machine learning person, you can use climate science by use case. I think the best way is like really to find some collaborators who are the opposite experts. Right? So if you're a machine learning expert, find climate science expert who is also interested in the same use case. And then you can kind of work together and ask them the questions. So the challenge of just using machine learning using climate data is you might miss the important things, right? So like, let's say you want to predict temperature, use temperature data set as an input, but because you're trying to predict temperature in a certain region, maybe it's also sensitive to vegetation cover and other things, and you actually should use other inputs too to improve your prediction. So sometimes um, having this kind of access to, to domain scientists is really helpful because they can kind of point you out in the right direction or tell you, okay, the key processes here are X, Y, Z. 
uh, and kind of help you to also understand like, oh, okay, this data in this region is very uncertain. Every model shows a different answer. Like we can't really trust any of this. So, so just kind of knowing what's, what's good and what's not good in a way. And like, you don't want to like train your model noise, right? You want to train it on that robust signal. Um, I think it's, it's a really fruitful way of collaboration. In terms of like where to get started, like I would say, start where you're interested in. So like pick one of the topics that you're really interested in. Like I want to predict well in Nino, like that's the tutorial, you have a chance to do that um, in the upcoming tutorial. Um, if you want to do downscaling, if you want to do like kind of like, I don't know, like Arctic sea ice modeling, like there's like so many subdomain re like directions. So, so have a look into what interests you, pick one use case, and then like, see, like research on this, like what machine learning techniques I use for this one use case. And maybe contact the people who do research on it and kind of like, that's how you can kind of blend in. Because of course you can't become expert on everything and like do research, like you kind of want to learn as you go, but like also like learn in a smart way. So don't try to do everything, but just like pick what you want and then like see what's useful in the specific use case. Thank you so much. Um, and then I'm leaving you with just a few minutes to um, to tease the tutorial and provide any other uh, any other information you want at the end. All right, that's uh, great. Well, these are really good questions. So I'm just going to share a few slides that are related to the um, tutorial. Uh, that is related to this topic. And just to clarify, so currently, I think everyone is doing tutorial related to carbon emissions lecture. Um, and then this tutorial is the next one, which will be on climate science and AI applications. And the office hours for this tutorial are next Monday, July 3rd. So you can find it on the CCI website, summer school schedule. Um, the tutorial will be about uh, forecasting of El Nino southern oscillations. So it's kind of like El Nino La Nina, right? So what is it? Uh, so it's a climatic phenomenon that happens periodically every couple of years, but of course it doesn't have, happen, happen always the same amount of years. So sometimes it happens like maybe every 10 years, sometimes less eight or seven. Like we know it is it's like going up and down, but we cannot know exactly is it this year or next year. It's really hard to predict which year is going to be El Nino year or La Nina year. Um, and it's, it's a cycle of warm and cold temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. And the dominant pattern that influences it is this like, kind of seasonal temperatures. Um, and broad implications of this El Nino are like for different climate sensitive sectors like energy, agriculture. Also El Nino is causing a lot of precipitation and La Nina as well, like in different regions and drought in some other regions. So it's kind of like has a lot of global implications on climate. Um, and that's why there's like a huge need for predicting it um, in a robust way. Like, do we know if the next year is going to be a Nino year or not? Because if it is, it might have a huge negative implication, for example, for uh, agriculture in some regions. Um, and then like, how do we measure the El Nino? So in this specific tutorial, we're going to be using a Nino 3.4 index, which is like a rolling three month average of the sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. So when you have like a map of climate change, you will like you will only possibly need only this region of the equatorial Pacific, and then you will know what's the sea surface temperature in that region and how it changes for each month. And then you're going to take a free month rolling mean to do that. Um, there's more instructions, of course, in the Jupyter notebook related to this tutorial. And just uh, to, to clarify, yeah, so sea surface temperature, that's also like SST. So you can call it SST. And if you see SST, it means the same thing. Um, and then like, again, like what's the current state of the art? So like most of the ENSO forecasts are issued by weather centers who run like physics-based models. Um, and in this tutorial, we're going to try to use neural networks, which potentially could use some more accurate forecasts. And they also have a lighter computational cost during the inference than the kind of physics-based models. So the challenge is that there is a limited amount of observations to use as training data for a neural network because we only have some uh, El Nino La Nina observations of the past uh, historical period, but it's not that long. And then the solution is to train on a simulated climate data from climate models. So basically what we're trying to use here is using those physics-based models I was talking about, like the CMYK5, CMYK6 models as the test bed. So you can use the CMYK6 model or CMYK5 models in, in this tutorial as your like, kind of like historical modeled temp uh, like temperatures of the sea surface temperature is going to be your kind of like data, like observational data in a way, like synthetic observational data. And then on this, you're trying to infer is the next year going to be El Nino or not? And you also have the answer because the the, histor the climate model gives you both historical and future, right? So, so you're basically like trying to treat this climate model run as your like kind of synthetic data. You have the past, you try to train your neural network onto that uh, past. And then you're going to try to see does the neural network predict the same thing as the climate model? 
Uh, so that's pretty much like how we're going to do using the predictor data as the surface temperature. And I think you have different choices in this tutorial. So you can either use entire globe of surface temperature, or you can use just the like Indian Ocean, for example. And then your target data, you all, you have the answer. You will have the answer for the historical period and then like also for the future period for the predictions. So you can see this El Nino, which is the red one. So like whenever the temperature, like this Nino 3.4 index is positive, it's a Nino year. If it's negative, it's La Nina. And you can see it oscillates, but then the width is different. So sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter. Sometimes La Nina is quite long, sometimes it's quite short. Um, so that's why you will have to make some choices. How do you ensure that you validate this model rigorously? Uh, can you use a combination of models and training schemes to create like an ensemble to create the best forecast for El Nino? What is the lead time? Like how much data you want to input to it and how far ahead you can make the predictions to make this model skillful? And also, can you extend this approach that you deliver in this tutorial to some other forecasts. So can you actually forecast temperature on land using the same method as you're doing for um, this NEO index on, on the ocean? So this is like several open-ended questions. And I think this tutorial is a very interesting um, in terms of like using real world climate data. So this is data from the climate models. If you want to use observations, it's, it would look very similar, but it's more patchy, right? Because we don't have observations in every single region. There'll be like lots of missing data areas. Uh, so that's why like, this is quite nice. And you can kind of use it as your training test bed for, for this sort of useful way. So <clears throat> uh, if you want to read some literature on this topic beforehand, um, you can use the Hamed All 2019 paper on deep learning for multi-year and so forecast from nature. And that's where they exactly use, like they use the SSTs, which is the sea surface temperature uh, for different lead times. So for like different kind of um, time horizons. And then they have this kind of convolutional filter and they use specific architecture of a convolutional neural network to arrive to this output layer, which is the Nino 3.4 index in the future. So basically the goal here is like, can I use different temperature maps from historical period or from most recent period? And can I predict Nino 3.4 into the future? Again, the architecture they use here is quite complicated. You can try using simpler one and maybe then expand it, or you can use the same one. Like, like you can play with it, what makes sense. But the idea here is like, can I predict the Nino 3.4 using this different kind of input maps? And again, like here's, uh, there's a comparison of different machine learning algorithms. So the ham and all is like the blue one. You can also see observations. So this is the grand truth is the red one. Uh, you can also have a uh, convoluted neural network with uh, uh, like long-term, short-term memory model, like the LSTM or some other neural network architecture. So you can kind of compare them and they all kind of uh, behave similarly, but you can see like even the Ham et al. paper, like maybe here it underestimates El Nino and uh, like the Nino 3.3 index and then like the observations were higher. And you can see actually the green one does quite well here. Um, so, so yeah, so just like look uh, into the different algorithms and try to see what you want to use. Thank you. Yeah, so right. Um, so basically, I think this is the, the tutorial. And if you have any questions, there'll be like an office hour for it uh, on Monday, on the coming Monday, July 3rd. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Takarska, for like teaching us. I, I learned a lot and there are so many great questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to everyone's question. Um, today, uh, we did our best. I'll, I'll be going through uh, online with Amanda. Probably we might try to catch a few more questions. And I just wanted to mention that there is another, uh, there are office hours today in three hours for the other, the first tutorial, which is estimating coal power plant um, operations, the carbon from coal plant operations. And there are also AMA at the same time tomorrow. So whatever time zone you're in now, plus three hours from now. Um, and thank you so much everyone for joining in today. And we look forward to seeing you on day four. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Bye.